Coming up on Tech News Weekly, Apple dribbled out a few new hardware updates a week ahead of its big announcement. Uh, the wire cutter has some tips on securing your smart home. Google wants to reinvent the game console, and Oculus has some very big updates, I think significant updates, to their VR hardware. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 75, recorded Thursday, March 21st, 2019. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Peak PTT, the leading provider of push-to-talk systems for business communications. For instant, always-on nationwide communications, visit peakptt.com. And use promo code TWIT for 15% off. And by Gazelle, the trusted online marketplace for buying and selling used devices. Visit gazelle.com slash twit to buy a certified pre-owned device and get 10% off your purchase. And by IT Pro TV, providing effective training with access to virtual labs and practice tests. Visit go.itpro.tv slash TNW, and you can take advantage of their lowest prices for the season. For an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription, make sure and use code TNW30 at checkout. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly. This is a show where every week we talk to the people making and breaking the tech news. I'm Megan Maroney. And I'm Jason Howell, ready to break some tech news. Yes, Let's it was it. it was like Christmas or Hanukkah this week. If your idea of gifts is a company announcing more stuff that you want to buy, even though none of it has been truly redesigned or significantly updated. Ouch. Here to join us to discuss Apple's week of product reveals is Greg Pierce, independent developer and creator of the Drafts app. Welcome to the show, Greg. Oh, thanks for having me. So for those of uh, who aren't familiar with the Drafts app or for those who are familiar with it and cannot use it because like Jason, they're on Android. That'll be me. <laughs> why don't you tell us, start by telling us a little bit about uh, Drafts. Uh, sure, Drafts is a, at its heart, a note-taking app, but is distinguished from most note-taking apps in that it concentrates on capturing text. It kind of wants to be the place where you get ideas, tasks, those things out of your head. Um, and it launches straight to uh, ready to edit uh, text box. You can dictate into it also, but it just kind of wants to be the thing that you launch first out of your dock to get things out of your head. It was originally sort of inspired as a trusted capture system from David Allen's GTD for people familiar with productivity stuff. Um, and you know, it's there on your Apple Watch to dictate, on your iPhone, on your iPad, and coming to the Mac starting next week. Um, you know, the place where all those little snippets go. Um, and then it does several other things as it's grown over time. It's been around since 2012, and it it's a very competent editor now and kind, kind of wants to be the place where anytime you have to work with text, you have a familiar, friendly editor that has the fonts you choose and the font sizes you're happy seeing um, and stuff that you can edit those, whether it's going to be a message or an email or a task, you have one friendly place to go edit it on your devices, even if you're going to end up copying and pasting it into something else. And the third thing it does is it has a rather powerful action framework to let you do anything with that text that you captured. I mentioned email, messaging, it integrates with a lot of third-party apps like task managers um, and calendar apps. It integrates with cloud services like Google Drive, Dropbox lets you write to or append to files. Um, so it kind of is a hub for text uh, on your devices. Well, I, I love it. And I am told that when you really train yourself to use it, it's great because I do have that instance where I'm sending an email and then all of a sudden I think I really need to send this in a text message and I'm cutting and pasting. And so it's great. And so, so, you know, every week when, I mean, every time Apple makes announcements, we usually have like the sort of the same Apple journalists come and talk to us, seeing people criticize us for having like Apple fans. But I thought that this, this week it would be, since Apple's doing something different, we'd have to do something different and talk to someone who's been a, an Apple developer for a long time and really, um, uh, understands, you know, these products and and really works to hope to understand how people use them. So let's talk a little bit about what you thought about um, these this week's announcements. First, 
Uh, let's start with my favorite, the the iPad mini that the, it's back. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, to cover the week in general, I, it sounds counterintuitive, but I'm most excited about the announcements this week because they are kind of boring. Uh, <laughs> but the reason for that is, you know, we get excited about all the great new Apple stuff that's in the keynotes and the new technologies and the innovation and new form factors. But most of that tends to serve the high end of the market. Um, and these boring announcements have been few and far in between the past few years for Apple. And those things actually really serve the middle and lower segments of the market, which is the bulk of my customers. Um, I want them to be getting good experiences with Apple devices because that's where I make my money is selling them products on those devices. So, I mean, for the iPad in general, if you consider the story, if you walked into an Apple store last week to buy an iPad, um, if you're the kind of customer who maybe wanted, maybe you were considering an iPad as a laptop replacement, wanted to do more productive things on it, you kind of had the option of the 329 entry level machine, which is very serviceable, but doesn't integrate with the keyboard case or uh, you know some of those things. Or you had to make the jump to the iPad Pro, which really was going to put you out $900 to $1,200 by the time you bought it and the necessary accessories. Um, and bringing those other options into the marketplace, like the Air in the middle tier with keyboard connectivity or the Mini for someone who's more concerned with the portability, it, it's just great to see them serving those segments more uh, substantially than they were. Um, and I'm curious to know, like, so when we're talking about the middle tier, so, okay, so full disclosure, I am that Android guy. And by the way, I am wondering when you're going to bring drafts to Android. But anyways, I'm sure you get that question all the time and it may be never, but there we go. Um, between the, the iPad mini and the iPad Air, they're both very much in a very attainable, you know, kind of price category. What What is going to be the determination for someone between the two devices? What Why, why is someone going to opt for one versus the other and, and for the app that you're making, does that even matter? It's probably your app is meant to service everything. Um, I, obviously, my app will work on all those devices and work great. I do think that the person who is likely to pick the iPad mini is maybe a more traditional iPad customer who's looking to use it for content consumption, for reading, for watching videos. Um, you know, it probably will be the most popular device for kids from mm -hmm. Apple you oh, know, sure. for the coming years. I think the Air is, is going to serve more of that professional market. Um, having the keyboard case is really uh, a game changer for the way you could use an iPad. Um, and if people have used iPads in the past without a keyboard, um, it's far more of a game changer than pencil compatibility in terms of actually being able to do a lot of work on a, on that device. So I think that's big for my market, which is more of a productivity mm -hmm. app. And well, clearly it's a text editor. So having a keyboard is a, is a big deal. But I think that, that people who make that jump to that device will find the iPad plays a whole different role in their life than they realized it, it would. Um, now, why do you think Apple chose to make these announcements this this way? It's very different than what they normally do. Um, well, because they're not very splashy. I mean, you they could have announced them as, you know, part of their event next week, but it's probably off topic for the other things they're planning to announce. And it's not something anybody's going to get really excited about Um that's not a bad thing. These are great updates. You know, also the case with the iMac, where if you had gone to buy one last week, you were getting two-year-old components, and now you're getting new ones. It's in the same box. It looks the same. It's nothing new to show on stage, but it doesn't really need to be. I mean, the iMac has more or less reached perfection form factor-wise for that type of device. So really, they just need to be making those spec bump updates so that those middle and lower end customers who come in to buy a Mac are getting something that's going to be viable for five to eight years or whatever an iMac usually services in a, in a workplace or a home. Um, yeah, not only that, Apple is, they are masters at understanding how to control kind of 
the the media, you know, how the media works around technology reporting, right? They start a week before their big announcement, trickle out these announcements day after day, every day a new product. Each time, like knowing that there's a big announcement that Apple has coming next week, all of those articles, all those, you know, those uh, those write-ups about these particular products happening each and every day, they're going to mention that event next week because they're, oh, by the way, this is all ahead of. So Apple knows how to play that game. Uh, I don't know how, how deeply Apple goes in, as far as, you know, rolling out these announcements with competitors, but Google had a big announcement earlier this week. Apple's just really good at marketing its products, and I think this is this is a big component to it. Um, absolutely, you know, this is a prime example of it. But that new iMac, uh, it's really interesting, you know, to point out that just last week you'd be getting two two year old spec and now you're getting this brand new uh you know updated version of the iMac which looks really nice um this i imagine in past years would have possibly meant less to you because your app wasn't working on the mac but now it will be so what are you excited about here um I want more people using Macs. I use Macs all day long myself obviously developing yeah. apps whether for iOS or the Mac um it it's beneficial all around and i do think that that market is mostly portable now people want laptops and apple's been doing a better job of keeping the laptops up to date uh but there's still a huge chunk of the market that's going to use those desktop systems wants the big display and you know i that's why i said earlier i wish they would do more of these boring updates mm -hmm. that it's almost embarrassing that they went two years you know, without spec bumping those uh, those machines. And I would like to see them do a little less focus on the major form factor revisions and do a little more focus, especially in the Mac marketplace, on doing those periodic uh, minor updates. And I'm sure that that has a lot to do with their reliance on Intel's roadmap and things like that that make it more difficult for them to work the way they like to work inside of Apple where they control all the hardware from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the reality of the marketplace. So, sure. So people were guessing that maybe today we would have laptops, new laptops, maybe tomorrow we'd have that um, air power, the, the thing that they've been talking about forever, uh, where you can charge your Apple Watch and your um, iPhone and your uh, AirPods, but we haven't seen anything today yet. Um, do you ha do you think that they're going to be releasing anything these last two days of the week? I don't know. It's pretty clear nothing today, and I I would tend to say nothing tomorrow. I wouldn't be surprised if, since it's become a big enough issue, the delay on the air power that they might not include it in their event next week. Just even if it's as a footnote. Um, rather than doing a press release on it. Uh, but you never know. Uh, They're always surprising us. But I assume once they took the day off today, they won't have anything tomorrow. Seems right. unlikely. Yeah, it kind of feels that way. Um, are you an, an AirPods user? Are you are you excited for the wireless charging kind of coming with the, the newer version of the AirPods? What do you think? I am one of that sad... 15% of the population whose ears do not get along with uh, the standard size AirPod. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do have a set. I like them. I use them at my desk for phone calls, but if I try to actually do anything like take a walk with them, they fall out of my ears. So I'm less excited than I might be otherwise. Um, I, I do think that that's interesting that Apple hasn't even thought about, well, I'm sure they thought about, but done anything to address that especially with a company that focused so much on um, accessibility and in so many aspects of their products, it seems surprising that people's ears are not something they're more aware of. Um, I'm with you. They don't fit in my ears either. And uh, yeah, I, I also just use them at my desk and I, I tried to run with them one time and I chronicled it um, by how many times they <laughs> fell out and I couldn't find them and I went looking for them. But you're right. I mean, they, it feels like we weird shaped ear people um, give us a chance, Apple. <laughs> That's what I say. Your, your, your ears are doing it wrong. That's, yeah. that's what's going on. Oh, I tried a few of those, the third party, little silicon things mm -hmm. and stuff you could put on them, but it's almost useless when you can't get them back in the charging case with those oh, things right. on it. It's, it's way too fiddly to make it worth it. Yeah. Uh, I have My tried son loves too. his, though. They're yeah. hardly ever out of his ears. Oh, so weird <laughs> shaped ears is not genetic then. Good to know. I guess not. <laughs> uh, Greg, or maybe he has a 
finished growing into his weird shape ears. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm all out for him in a year. <laughs> you should live it up while he can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Greg Pierce is the creator of the Drafts app, the Tally app for quick counting, a dictionary and thesaurus app called Terminology, and a simple puzzle game called Diced. Uh, as he mentioned earlier, app for Mac is coming out very soon, next week. And you can see all of his work at agiletortoise.com. And he is also Agile Tortoise on Twitter. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. It was fun. <laughs> Thank you. It was Take a lot care. of fun talking with you. Take care. Up next, Megan and I spar. We spar with our stories of the week. Not mm -hmm. we're, It's not going to get violent, I promise. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Peak PTT. Company cell phones are not only expensive, but they can also be huge time wasters for employees. You can boost productivity and cut down costs with Peak PTT technology, the leading provider of push-to-talk systems. That's what PTT stands for, push-to-talk, uh, for business communications. Peak provides advanced IP-based PTT systems for small, medium, and enterprise businesses. So you can leverage the internet, cellular data, and Wi-Fi networks to transmit voice over the internet. Peak PTT uh, provides instant talk, location monitoring, and emergency alert notifications. You get local, nationwide, and worldwide coverage. Uh, super rugged devices, and that's one of the big uh, drivers, the big you know reasons why you want to go with a really nice PTT solution like Peak, because these are made to withstand dust, dirt, water, extreme temperatures. You can take these out into the, into the field, and you don't have to worry about them getting destroyed or like your, your delicate, fragile touch screen getting shattered. Uh, no contracts and service billing is month to month. And you get less than one second connection time. It connects almost instantly. You can instantly connect with hundreds of users at once so everybody hears you or talk privately with anyone in your group. They have central tracking and communication center from any PC, so you can log into a PC and track these devices. Real-time GPS tracking for accurate and complete visibility and SOS notifications. The K2 PTT system is ideal for small and medium-sized businesses. The system includes an affordable walkie-talkie style handset that you can see right here, uh, PTT 84G, iOS and Android apps, PC dispatch software for device location tracking, like I said, as well as light PC dispatch client software. And then, hold on one second, the Everest system is what you have right here. This is the Everest PTT system. It's capable of handling deployments of any size. Uh, rugged IP6768 dedicated PTT headsets. You get five nines of network availability, low latency rates. Latency is a big deal when it comes to PTT. Uh, and PC-based dispatch console to locate devices on demand and view on a map. And you get easily and efficiently handle those SOS events uh, when they arise. PTT calls last an average of 15 seconds. That's versus more than 50 seconds for traditional calls. So they're really good at keeping things direct and to the point. If you want your team to get right to the point, uh, that's that's the best way to do it is with PTT uh, through Peak. Get in touch faster and operate more efficiently with Peak PTT. Visit peakptt.com and use promo code TWIT at checkout for 15% off. That's peakptt.com. Use promo code TWIT for 15% off. And we thank Peak PTT for their support. All right, story of the week time. Meditation is all about spending time with yourself, diving into that dark chasm that is your mind and staying with the silence long enough to hear the words of your authentic spiritual self speaking to you. I may, may be speaking a different language to you right now. I don't know, but <laughs> one can very easily drop down onto the floor or into a chair, close their eyes, drift off into bliss, or they could pitch in on Eric Antonow's Kickstarter project called Silent Meditation on v Vinyl. Uh, for $20, you too could have received your very own 12-inch copy of Silent Meditation, uh, 20 minutes per side of complete silence. No voice guiding you through the experience. No soft and soothing new age music to zone out to, just the sound of the needle drifting effortlessly through the winding groove of the record on the player you have in your meditation chamber. What do you think? 20, 20 minutes of silence per side on this final to help you meditate, Megan. Um, well, first of all, you can still get it, even though the Kickstarter is okay. over. You can pre-order. Right. Still Kickstarter $20. Kickstarter ended yesterday, but right. The more you order, uh, they get cheaper. Oh, okay. Um, so Wow. Get tons of them. <laughs> the first thing I, I, I have thoughts. <laughs> I thought you might. <laughs> the first thought I had was it sounds like a pet rock. Do you remember the pet rock? I remember the pet rock. I never had one. <laughs> but, but very like yeah. 70s, like a thing we're going to sell you. 
it's not really a thing. <laughs> we created a thing out of nothing. But I do like the idea and it does remind us that you, because he got this idea from his 14 or 15 year old who got a record player and they went to look for records. And so it's nice <laughs> to me that record players are coming back and it is sort of like, you know, my 14 year old also has a record player and just sort of sits there. He has my parents old records but he doesn't really use it very often so yeah, yeah. i think people buying this it might just be like a, a, a gift like a pet rock um also i love the sound yeah. but um i cannot meditate with silence with complete silence yeah doesn't i work can't for you. i can't the the as each week goes by in my life i realize i'm more and more uncomfortable with silence yeah. which is probably why I should spend more time being silent. <laughs> I understand that. But I use Calm. Uh, it's a sponsor. Yeah. Um, and there's a little bit of, I think in the 10-minute medi Calm meditation, there's usually like um, maybe a minute of silence, which feels like three years oh, to okay. me. But okay. then, and then they remind you like, oh, you know, you've probably, if you've drifted off, then come, come back. back. Come and back. so, yeah, um, yeah I, I do uh, like, I, I like a little help when I'm meditating, true silence, and I uh, haven't gotten along in, in many years, and maybe we never will again. You know, everyone has a different has a, has a different thing that pulls them through. If they, if they kind of dedicate themselves to meditation, what works right. for them? I definitely needed guided in the beginning. Now I'm to a point where I can do silence, and actually I kind of prefer it. But I, it's like I need a little launch pad at the beginning yeah. to kind of settle myself down. Uh, personally, I love the sound of needle on. Uh, on a record uh -huh. like that kind of crackly kind of yeah. you know a little bit of that low end frequency when it moves around yeah. a little bit of that cra that high end crackling so this is silly this is ridiculous no question about it they had a $600 goal they ended up uh through the kickstarter ended up making almost $6000 on this so you know, I'm sure, and that's 206 backers. I'm sure that that's a combination of people who are like, okay, sure, I'll listen to a needle on a record and meditate to that. I'm sure there are a lot more people though that did this just to say that they have 20 seconds or 20 minutes of silence mm -hmm. on a on a piece of vinyl that mm -hmm. they can hang up or they can surprise their friends when they come over. And hey, there's some value there too. Right. <laughs> it's I, not I the agree. end of the world. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Oh, I don't know if you knew this, but um, this also reminded me there is a composer named John, John Cage. Cage. Have you mm -hmm. heard of John Cage? I his, have. Yeah. And, yeah. And you've heard of his four minutes and 33 seconds of silence? I have heard of. Yes. I, uh, I was a John Cage fan back in the day. I had a friend who was a musician, was really into that sort of um, his, you know, he'd play weird things. Oh yeah, he's, silence he's and, super out there, yeah. Um, and it made me think about Visit from the Goon Squad, which is a novel by Jennifer Egan. And there's many chapters are devoted to uh, the long pauses in uh -huh. music uh -huh. and how like so certain songs have really long pauses and um, how, again, I'm not the only person uncomfortable because they talk about four minutes of silence in a song is like, that's, that's about how much Americans can stand in right. a song. And then they just go insane. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I can imagine being like in the case of uh, four minutes and 33 seconds of silence, which is the name of the John Cage's uh, composition. And it is exactly that. Like I would actually love to experience that. And it kind of, it sounds like a silly thing, but the concept behind it is actually really brilliant, right? Like if you've got a, 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 a room filled with thousands of people and they're all sitting there listening to four minutes and 33 seconds of silence. The composition is the sound of the room is the sound of all of those people in the room mm -hmm. being still and sure. And you know, surely nothing's perfectly still, nothing's perfectly quiet. So really the composition are the weird little noises that people make when they shuffle in their chairs mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. And so I kind of see the vinyl as kind mm -hmm. of something similar, right? Like, yes, it's silly, it's stupid, it's ridiculous that, some, that you didn't think about it first. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Weird, yeah. But But there is some benefit, although I could also just record that 20 minutes of silence uh, with a, with a, you know, the needle on the record and record that and then listen to that in my headphones. That would probably be just as good also. Mm -hmm. Who the heck knows? <laughs> well, we have talked about all the ways our social media might be used against us in the dystopian future, or right now. <laughs> but this idea was broken down to specifics in a piece the Wall Street Journal posted this week entitled, Can a Facebook Post Make Your Insurance Cost More? The short answer is not necessarily right now. Uh, the journal says that some companies are checking social media posts, but most are not. 
However, they are not avoiding lurking uh, for ex ethical reasons. That's not why they're avoiding it. They're not checking because right now it's easier and cheaper to tell what we've been up to health-wise by just taking our blood and checking our pee, which insurance companies already do. Uh, in other words, it's not yet cost-effective to look through our Facebook posts to determine if we smoke cigarettes while rock climbing or use heroin while riding a motorcycle without a helmet. Uh, if you're going to do that, do not post pictures of yourself doing that on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> ethically, idea. it's totally okay to check. And since we all know that our social media posts stick around forever, the Wall Street Journal suggests that we keep our risky behavior off social media and do our best to keep our social media just between friends. Yeah. I mean, this is really what, what privacy advocates have been saying all along, right? Is mm -hmm. that we're gonna get, we're all going to get so comfortable and so used to sharing every little detail about our lives that at some point, this, this would be like one of those big flags that, oh, no, now insurance companies realize there's a lot of information in this stuff we're putting out there. Uh, and, you know, here we are. Like, this this could be the beginning of that. I'm actually surprised it didn't start happening sooner. I would And I would also say, like, if, uh, if you're posting on social media, like, have some control, like, at the very least, decide with some controls around what's public and what's private, right? Like, I know with Facebook you can determine only these people see it, right? And Well, one would hope that- One that. would hope. I mean, <laughs> are those people sitting there taking screenshots of the thing that you shared and whatever? Who the heck knows? But um, you have a little bit of control, but nothing is certain. And mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the ult ultimate point. How deep can the insurance companies look into Facebook servers when you delete your Facebook account? Mm -hmm. Everything lives on the internet for free, sure. But like I deleted my Facebook account. I know, f I'm assuming Facebook probably still owns- and has all of my stuff on a server somewhere. Um, but would the health health insurance companies really have access to that? Probably not. No, right? not right now, but you don't know. You know, you know, <laughs> Facebook's possible. made kind of deals with all kinds of companies that we were surprised. Oh that man, they did. that would be so sleazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> even even the people who have deleted accounts will go ahead and share you their information right. insurance yeah. company. Yeah. And you know, who the, who the heck knows? Maybe this happens behind closed doors and no one ever knows about it. Mm -hmm. But And this um, is probably yeah. obvious to most of you, but one thing that, that people do do is if you're making like a, a car insurance claim about an accident, the insurance companies will go on the web and look yeah. like, did you post on Twitter about how drunk you were before you got in that accident that you blamed on someone else? Or, you know, just things like that, that, that you know, if they, they will look for that that's cost effective for them to make sure that your your claim is correct and accurate. I, and I kind of feel like that that's yeah. their right to do that, right? right? Like yeah. if you're filing a, a claim that you got into a, a car accident and this stuff happened, if you were dumb enough to put on, on the public web, yeah. you know, that evening, I wow, I'm drinking a lot, you know, right. whatever. Like, I, I feel like that's kind of fair game. Yeah, I'm that assuming they probably do with like disability claims and things probably. like that too, yeah. But it is a weird, like, it is a kind of a murky it's a line that I, I, as much as I understand it, I also feel uncomfortable crossing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but sure, your smart your smart home is smart, but that doesn't make it safe. After the break, Rachel Saracola from the Wire Cutter tells us how to lock down our smart homes. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Gazelle, the trusted online marketplace for buying certified pre-owned devices. Okay, you set your creative and your professional goals but do you have the right tools to tackle them? We all need tools. It's time to upgrade your devices with Gazelle. Devices are available in fair, good, and excellent condition, and all at great prices. And if you are buying new new stuff, now's the time because people are getting rid of their stuff because they want the new stuff that Apple's announcing. So now's the time to, to buy new stuff. Everything from iPhone 6 through iPhone 10. There's a variety of Samsung Galaxy phones. They offer MacBooks, Air, and Pro and iPad, Standard Air, and iPad Pros. Every device goes through a 30-point inspection. Devices are backed by a 30-day return policy. There's no restocking fee and free shipping. All of their products are sold without a carrier contract and are available for support by major carriers, or you can buy them unlocked. Financing is available on all devices with Affirm. Get instantly approved and pay off in three, six, or 12 months. Just select, select financing with Affirm at checkout. With Gazelle's incredible selection of quality pre-owned devices, they're also an excellent choice for students. Don't know what to do with your old devices? You can check out Gazelle for competitive offers on all your used phones, your tablets, or your computers. 
don't keep that stuff in a drawer. Getting rid of that stuff and giving and selling it to someone that's going to use it, that is the best way and it, it lessens your guilt for upgrading. Level up this year with new tech from Gazelle. Visit gazelle.com slash twit to buy a certified pre-owned device and get 10% off your purchase. That's gazelle.com slash twit. And we thank Gazelle for their support. So a lot of people laugh at me when they come over and see how much of my home is connected to the internet. But the simple fact is I like turning my lights off and on with my voice and I like getting an alert on my Apple Watch when my coffee is done. And I like locking my home, my, locking my front door from my iPhone while I'm at work. And that is why I invited Rachel Saracola, staff writer for The Wirecutter, to tell us about her recent piece on how to protect your smart home from hackers. Welcome to the show, Rachel. Hi. Thanks so much for coming on. So you start your story by citing a few pretty terrifying ways that people's smart homes have been used against them. How common are these kinds of hackers? Um, well, actually, they're not as common as you think, but the potential is certainly there. Um, I spoke to an expert for this article who mentioned that anything that's connected to the Internet is definitely a target. So um, I think that uh, while we haven't seen any numbers for how many people are being hacked just yet, it, this is something that's just starting to come out. More people are starting to do stories on it. And I think we'll, we'll probably see some numbers soon. So uh, how did you do your research? What, what was involved in the research in, in this piece? I talked to a lot of experts, read a lot of stories, um, like I said, like you had mentioned, the beginning of the article talks about a few people who recently had their cameras talk to them or um, people who had their lights go on and off. So I looked at a lot of those and, and looked up a lot of cyber experts. And um, I even talked to an ethical hacker. And uh, there was a lot of interesting information out there um, that says that it can happen and you really should be protecting yourself. So what is the first thing I should do? If you're hacked? Uh, no, to protect myself. Oh, I tell everybody <laughs> above everything, please use passwords. Use unique passwords. Don't use your address. Don't use your birthday. Don't even use your dog's name. And you should be using unique passwords for every device that you have. Oof. <laughs> it's it's so much work, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> My, is my data worth all this work? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, that that's... I feel like with security and with IoT, where we find ourselves right now is that the bar has been lowered so far as far as how to make your home safe or uh, uh, smart, which is great. That's what IoT uh, manufacturers want. They want everybody to get a smart home. But there's so many of these roadblocks, these hurdles that are kind of, you know, re almost required if anyone actually wants to do it smartly. So changing the password on all these devices might not necessarily be something that Joe Schmo, who, you know, picks up, you know, some smart home device, uh, you know, they might not even know how to how to go about that. Like, and that's going to be different per device, right? Like what's, what's the easy strategy there to know how and where to apply that? Well, uh, some devices have you change the password right off the bat. So yeah. it's very easy. You do the setup through the app and they'll walk you through it. Other ones, I would just advise that people, even for devices that do allow you to do that, you should poke around the app, see what kind of features you have, see what kind of information you're giving away to the company. Um, but it, it's very important that you you check out, you know, password and the ability to change it. I do think that some people figure they're paying so much money for these devices that right out of the box, it's safe and secure. And that's not the case at all. Mm hmm. So uh, I always check Wirecutter before I buy anything. I'm so sad whenever I like want to buy something and I look up and there's no, um, like I do the Wirecutter search and, and there's nothing there. I'm like, how I can't possibly make this decision by myself. Why hasn't the Wirecutter reviewed this? But for smart home products, you've reviewed most of them, but you're the one doing the reviewing. So how do you keep your network safe if you're just like throwing a device on there that you don't know, you don't know for sure is safe? Um, well, same as I advice to everybody else. I make sure I use unique passwords and really I am running out of them at this point. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, I also suggest that 
what I do is you set up a guest network through your router and I put all of my smart home devices on that guest network. So, you know, if anything happens, which thank goodness has not happened yet, but if anything happens, I can isolate all those devices from the rest of my network, which involves, you know, my banking information, any other personal information and my family. I'm sure my son and husband would be very upset if I cut, took down the network for any problems. <laughs> Wow, that's a really good tip. That's a great tip right there um, to isolate a guest network. I never thought to do that and only have your IoT going on its own specific network. Um, so I've done searches, you know, in my own smart homening, if that's a word, it's not. Um, <laughs> In, in order to staff, you know, stock up my home with smart home devices, I've had to get some like smart plugs and you go online and you do a search for smart plugs. 90, 90 to 95% of the brands that you get back, you've never heard of before. Right. And then there's the 5% that you have. And it just makes me realize like it's easy to see the low price device when you're talking about IOT compared to the higher priced brands that you do recognize and think, oh, well, you know what, what, what could possibly go wrong? Um, I'm, I'm sure this is probably a bad idea, right? You, you probably want to opt for the brands that you recognize. What's your, what's your advice around that? Um, absolutely 100% agree with you. I love a good bargain more than anybody, but when it comes to smart home devices, it's usually not a good idea. Um, you, you, there's so many brands out there that you've never heard of before, but you really should try and go with an established brand, uh, even if they're a little bit more money, just because they're, they're always looking to make their products better. Um, they take feedback from customers very seriously. Uh, they want your money. So they want to provide a good product that is safe and, you know, things happen and these companies that are more established, they respond well to them. They have the infrastructure to do uh, uh, software updates, security updates. So if something is found and a lot of times they're found by users, um, they jump into action and try to fix it as soon as possible. So if all of my devices are on the on Apple's HomeKit network, am I inherently more secure? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely think that Apple is very strict with who they give HomeKit certification to, which is why there really aren't that many HomeKit devices out there. There's a good amount, but not as many as you'd find with other uh, voice platforms. Um, that said, they're still... Apple isn't actually making these products. To, they're still subject to the same vulnerabilities as any other device. So you should take the same precautions. You point out in your article something that I think a lot of people don't uh, don't consider. We, we and we talk about it on the show a lot, you know, holding ma the manufacturers, the creator of these uh, devices accountable for the security that they either do adhere to or do not at all are irresponsible with. But you point out like, you know, whose responsibility at the end of the day is it? Right now that we want to blame the hardware manufacturers, but it really lies in the hands of the person buying the product, right? Um, how, how should that play out? How can, how can people take more responsibility on a broad level and understand that it does kind of reside in their hands right now? Right. Uh, well, you, you should know what you're getting into, know how the product operates. And like we've been talking about, make sure you put good passwords on it create a guest network, um, do regular software updates. Many of these devices update automatically. Uh, you should research your product pretty well before you buy it just to make sure it is, um, it's known for good security, whether that's, you know, product reviews from professionals or users. Users, I trust a lot more a lot of the times because they're they have these things. They're not just using it for a week or two weeks. They have it in their daily lives. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you really have to look into it and make sure you're doing the right things, especially, like I said, about the passwords. I would recommend that above. If you're not going to do anything else, put a good password. <laughs> yeah, right. Now, as, as part of all your smart home product reviews, um, all the wire cutter staff goes through and, and privacy is part of that. Um, so, it, and security. So what happens if a device, like a lot of times a device comes out and you test it and then maybe later there was some sort of uh, insecurity found. Do you guys go back and update those pieces? 
Absolutely. First, I get really sad about it. And then <laughs> I, <laughs> I look into it. Um, I look into everything, whether it comes from the manufacturer or a reader. We long term test all of our top picks uh, just to make sure something like this doesn't happen or sometimes something seems great and all of a sudden it dies after a month. Oh, that's awful. But uh, but we go back and retest. We check with the manufacturer to see what they're doing about it. And we absolutely update our readers as quickly and uh, comprehensively as possible. Uh, IoT and security, hand in hand, they go hand in hand, security being incredibly poor in IoT. And obviously you have your hands in a lot of this IoT stuff. Are you are you surprised by now? <laughs> Probably not at the horrible state of security that seems to be within IoT as a whole. I mean, it's just it seems like it's not improving. And do you think regulation is going to help? I, I think there are a lot of people pushing for regulations, whether or not they help. I mean, I just would like to get something going on it at this point. Um, yeah. it, it is from where I sit, it it's almost hard to recommend some of these products. People are so freaked out by them, but, um, but I do love my smart home products and, uh, I, I do recommend them. I, I love having cameras. I love having smart plugs. Um, but I think manufacturers aren't going to be able to avoid the security aspect much longer. They're pretty soon that will be a huge selling point for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, just a simple, like, you know, allow us to change the password. I mean, I think that that is that is changing a little bit, but I mean, just the, it doesn't seem that difficult to have certain standards. What, right. what, what besides being able to change the password, not using, well, I guess they have to have a default password, but what are some other things that could help with regulation? Um, I think that, you know, knowing that your inform where where your information is going, a lot of these uh, companies not only take, you know, your email address, but they might know where you, you know, your location. They have um, features such as geofencing, so they know where you live and um, things like that really need to be encrypted. And they also need to let uh, customers or users know that they're doing these things. Like I said, I think eventually it will be a selling point, like look how safe our products are. Mm -hmm. um, but they also, manufacturers need to educate people that there are simple things that they can do. Um, just like we were just talking about, as easy as it, it seems to change a password, some people don't know how to do that. They don't know how to um, enable you know, other security measures that might be included with the devices, they might not even know that they have them. So the manufacturer really needs to put that information out there. Rachel Saracola is a staff writer at The Wirecutter. She has great pieces on, she's done extensive reviews on cameras and plugs and so many different things. Um, go to The Wirecutter to see her reviews. You can also follow her on Twitter. She is Rachel Saracola on there and, uh, and is a great follow. So thank you so much for coming on, Rachel. Oh, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thank Take you, care. Rachel. Have a good talk, day. Talk to you soon. Coming up, some big news from the Game Developers Conference this week. I feel like there were a couple of streams happening from there, and we're going to talk all about that with Russell Hawley. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV, experienced IT professionals who deliver comprehensive training at the click of your mouse. Spring is here. And there has never been, officially, as of yesterday, there's never been a better time than now to take advantage of their lowest prices ever. You can purchase a standard membership, video only, for $28.50 per month. Uh, you can upgrade to a premium membership, which is video plus labs, and you also get practice tests uh, for $42 a month. And you can save even more. IT Pro TV is still honoring our special offer. That's 30% off for Twit listeners, dropping the standard membership to only $19.95 per month. That comes out to about $199 per year and the premium to $29.50 per month or $2.95 per year. Stream IT Pro TV's courses live and on demand worldwide. No matter where you are, you can do it on all sorts of devices, Chromecast, Roku, Amazon, Fire uh, TV, Apple TV, PC, of course, iOS and Android apps. All across the board, you're going to be able to find their content. New content is added daily, so your training is always aligned with the latest certifications and the most current exams. Episodes go from studio to web in just 24 hours. IT Pro TV is CompTIA's official video training partner, uh, so you get 12 CompTIA on-demand courses. CompTIA A+, 
Network Plus, and Security Plus certs. Uh, and so much more. If you're familiar with Twit content and kind of the live style and approach that we do with our shows here, you're going to be super familiar and super comfortable with what you get with IT Pro TV. Visit go.itpro.tv slash TNW. Make sure and use code TNW30 and you'll get started with your standard or premium membership. Don't let another season pass you by without earning your IT certifications. That's go.itpro.tv slash TNW and use code TNW30 for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, flexible training, binge-worthy content, life-changing results. The Game Developers Conference has been underway in San Francisco all week, and one man has braved the packed halls and crowded lines to bring us the best from the event. Russell Hawley from Android Central and Windows Central is that man, and he joins us now from his hotel room. Welcome back, Russell. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Great. It's awesome to get you back, man. Uh, and it looks like you've been having a lot of fun this week. Let's start with Google's attempt to change how we game uh, with this big event unveiling Stadia earlier this week. Leo and I covered the event live uh, as a Twit special here. The idea of a console in the cloud sounds incredibly compelling, but Google is promising the moon, as it usually does, uh, with Stadia. Others have tried this, and some of them have failed. Are you optimistic that Stadia can deliver this time? There are some incredibly lofty goals here that came from that presentation, but the core technology that surrounds this, we've kind of already seen with mm -hmm. the, the Project Stream demo that happened late last year, and that worked really well in a lot of different environments. I was really hesitant to, to dive into that at first, and through a lot of the tests that I ended up doing over the course of that time, it worked on mobile network connections, it worked in my home, it worked on, on a bus one time connected to a hotspot. Uh, you know, it, it worked in a ton of environments. It wasn't perfect, and there were definitely some times where there were some latency issues worth discussing. But as a as a beta that we saw early on, it was surprisingly solid, especially compared to some of the competition for game streaming that have existed for a while now. Yeah, yeah. And now uh, they did leave out a lot in the announcement. Like even though the announcement was a, an hour long and there was a lot crammed in there, there were some very notable omissions. And it, maybe that's just because it's early days. But game titles cost, even just the sorry state of broadband in the U.S. compared to a lot of other places throughout the U.S. or uh, throughout the world. Uh, how concerned are you about the fact that these details were left out or does that make a lot of sense based on the state of Stadia at this point? Yeah, so I mean, there's two things to keep in mind here. The first is that this was not necessarily a consumer pitch. I mean, Google obviously wanted to get the world's attention with Stadia, but this very much was a developers, we really want you to come and build games here, uh, you know, kind of pitch with with all of the information that was dropped there. So, so seeing a game lineup uh, wasn't something that I was expecting, but it's really interesting that that we got, you know, very, very little, like, you know, only two or three games and then a couple of developers that got put alongside, you know, as kind of we're happy to support this platform uh, kind of introductions. As for the actual latency itself, there's a couple of things that are really interesting here. The first is, you know, the, the national average uh, internet connection is something like 15 megs a second, which as you pointed out is really not great compared to the, the global standard. Uh, but we saw some hard numbers from Google. They expect 4K at 60 frames per second to function on as low as a 30 meg connection which is not great for the national average, but in a lot of places, it means that 4K gaming is something that's actually possible on, on what would be a relatively uh, short jump from the average to, you know, to reach within a fairly short period of time. So I think Google's actually targeting a slightly larger audience than we may anticipate uh, with that, that compression algorithm that they say is, is kind of very proprietary to, to make stream work. So you said this is for developers. Does that, I mean, can any games that have already been developed be played on this or does it have to be a whole, do you have to develop an entire new game first to be used on Stadia? No, you're not going to need to develop an entirely new game. In fact, uh, several of the games that are uh, in demos right now are games that already exist. Uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey was part of the, the launch for the, the beta and in the demo areas that we have here. Uh, Doom is, is one of the games that's available to play, which is a, a fairly recent game as well. And so existing game developers are going to have tools to be able to port their existing titles up uh, to Stadia and have it run there. But a lot of the news that we got from the conference yesterday really suggested that the best possible experience is going to come from building specifically for these users. You know, making it clear that there are online specific tools building for those environments uh, is going to make some kind of difference. So I'm, I'm interested to see what that actually means. 
Yeah, and how that reaches into the YouTube experience for you know right. creators or, or players who are, are are casting to people who are watching. There's a lot of kind of like co-op opportunities and all that has to kind of be coded into the game specifically for support of the stadium platform stadia platform um you so you spent some time uh i'm i'm imagining you spent some time with it in the pre in, you know kind of in the beta stages at some point but you definitely got some time with it there they have some demonstration booths set up for it also with their uh the stadia branded controller i believe i don't know if you actually had a chance to use the controller through the experience but what was your takeaway from having having that time with the system yeah so they you know they announced three different colors for the stadia controller uh, you know very similar to kind of the pixel color lineup uh in in its uh palette and all of them are here but under glass cases uh, oh, okay. there there is no touching them they're not actually part of the demo stations but in a same way that actually highlights one of the other things that stadia is promising as a feature is you're able to kind of bring your own controller and to that point there are tons of different controllers in the demo stations here to choose from logitech very simple pc game pads uh, uh, more complicated, uh, you know, very experienced, you know, kind of pro gaming game pads for things like PlayStation and Xbox. And uh, there are a couple of highlight demos here that also feature the Xbox adaptive controller for uh, people who have accessibility concerns that should be able to just plug right in and work with Stadia. Hmm. So nice. you said you could, um, like you tried this on a bus. Um, I mean, what about like data caps? Like how, do, how does that work? It seems like you could pretty um, quickly eat up all your data by playing mm -hmm. like one game on a bus with this. <laughs> no, you absolutely would. Yeah, this is this is going to be something like 20 megabytes a minute, uh, you know, if you're if you're playing at 4K60. Uh, and we know that the gameplay can scale itself down as far as 720p at 30 frames per second, uh, which consumes way less data. But caps are still definitely going to be something that people are going to have to be aware of if they decide to play in those environments. Yeah, absolutely. So Stadia is really cool and everything, but you also uh, had some time to spend with the newly announced Oculus Rift S, which is an upgraded Rift system, uh, this time with inside out tracking, higher, higher resolution display, sounds super compelling. Uh, and I know you got some time, I'm assuming you played lightsaber. I think that's what they had on demonstration with the S. What did you think of this, like of, of this newer upgraded system? Yeah, so Beat Saber is actually available on the Oculus Quest, which oh, was a, a separate announcement uh, that was earlier this week, uh, which is also very cool. You know, being able to play such a, a high fidelity and very active game on a standalone headset is, is a very cool thing uh, that I'm sure people will really enjoy later this year. But the uh, the Oculus Rift S really just kind of feels like a checklist of things that people wish were slightly better about the Oculus Rift, all kind of delivered in one package. You know, there's no more stand up cameras for, uh, you know, to, to worry about tracking with. It's all the same kind of inside out tracking that we've seen with Windows Mixed Reality headsets and with the Oculus Quest. Nice. And, and it actually fixes some of the Oculus Quest uh, tracking concerns when you have the controllers either close to your chest or trying to reach back behind you uh, with some additional cameras to do that. Uh, but because it's relying on a PC still to, to do all of the graphics powering and stuff, there's also uh, a, a visual mode that isn't available to test here, uh, but it's called pass through mode that makes it so that you are, it's taking those two front cameras and making it so that you can walk around in the room around you and see the real world. Uh, but instead of using a single camera like we've seen with HTC Vive and, and uh, Samsung's uh, Gear VR, uh, it's actually using stereo uh, visuals so that you still can perceive depth inside the headset and it doesn't feel kind of awkward or disorienting to walk around with the headset on. So is it, was it actually more comfortable? Did you... Would you agree? It's then? definitely more comfortable. The the Halo style band uh, that that connects kind of to the back of the head is a lot more comfortable. Uh, even just for me, I can only imagine it's way more comfortable for people who have uh, their hair up or wear uh, you know any kind of headdress or anything like that would be uh, significantly more comfortable with this kind of Halo design instead of the the strap system that Oculus has had before. Yeah, yeah, I like the Halo design much better. Um, and then, so the Rift S which is uh, the Rift S and then the Oculus Quest. So these are the two devices that they were really talking a lot about. They're definitely different systems, yet they're going to be priced at the same cost, $399 at launch. Who knows when they're going to launch these sometime this year. What do you think are the big trade-offs then? Why wouldn't someone want the Oculus Quest, which is totally detached from a computer? I'm assuming kind of lower processing uh, compared to a computer. Like, I don't know. Why, why would you pick one versus the other? 
Yeah, so I mean, Oculus Quest is an entirely standalone environment. It has its own computer built in. It doesn't connect to a computer. Uh, you know, it doesn't have any kind of external uh, tracking or anything like that. Uh, and it runs on what's essentially a phone processor. It's a Snapdragon 835, which as you know, someone who plays with phones all the time, you're pretty familiar with the limitations of of what that can do on a phone. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the headset itself offers some additional cooling so they can kind of overclock it a little bit and get a little more performance out of it. Uh, but it's still not going to be the kind of experience that you would get when connected to a PC. And a big part of the talks here at GDC uh, are about kind of scaling down some of the game experiences from the traditional Rift games so that you can play things like Beats Saber or job simulator or things like that in the quest and have it feel very similar to the PC environment, but still definitely not the same. You, you'll get a, a much better visual experience uh, out of the system that's connected to the PC. The downside there being you need a PC that's capable of driving it and you still have a cable coming out of the back of the headset and connecting to this box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You also wrote about how it's easier to set up. Um, I've never done that before. Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> Yeah, so the Oculus Rift right now, when you go to set it up, you kind of hold your controller and you walk around in a uh, in a box and and you kind of draw uh, you know a virtual grid and it's what uh, Oculus calls the Guardian system. So if you step near uh, those lines that you've drawn, you get kind of a, a warning in front of you saying that you're stepping out of this and you might do something like punch a window or accidentally you know hit a person uh, and some of those things that you probably shouldn't do in VR. Uh, but the the setup for Oculus Quest, because there are no kind of hard tracking lines, is actually a little more convenient. The the system is designed to be constantly looking for where walls and things like that are. So instead of you know tracing a, a map around a room, you can actually stand in the center and and with an almost laser pointer like design from the controller, actually just kind of trace a, a system around you and that becomes your barrier system. And it actually remembers that barrier system when you go from room to room. So if I have uh, a space in my office and then a space in my living room, I don't have to redraw it when I go into that room. It just scans the room and remembers what room that is and, and redraws those boundaries. Yeah, oh, that's neat. I like that a lot. Um, so sometime this year, we don't really have uh, apparently a release date on this, but... Yeah, spring is what we've got for both of these. Oh, okay. Uh, and and so it's pretty reasonable. Longer. Yeah, I mean, basically, we got spring as the answer for the Oculus Go last year, and that ended up being released along the uh, Facebook F8 conference. Yeah. Uh, so I'm kind of hoping that they do something pretty similar this year. Interesting. Something to look forward to. Uh, another thing to look forward to, you found yourself mesmerized by a totally not haunted radio called Klaxo. And I'm confused. What is a radio? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it's this weird thing. So yeah, this was just kind of sitting uh, not near any of the other game demos. It was just kind of tucked away. And, and it was this delightful woman who was standing next to this this loud little radio that was telling a story. And it was an interactive radio story, uh, you know, where it was kind of going through uh, th this mystery, you know, something had happened. I'm going to try and not give away a ton of details. Uh, but, you know, something had happened and you were trying to, to solve this mystery and you made selections by turning the knob on this radio uh, to kind of advance things in the story. And you could follow this very traditional kind of mystery story to its conclusion, or you could deviate wildly and discover uh, this uh, this mystery inside of the physical radio itself where it was, as we were assured, totally not haunted. Uh, and, and so it just became this really fun experience. It was very interactive. And there's actually going to be uh, there, there's a, a web beta now that you can check out. And there's actually going to be a mobile version of this uh, at some point in the future when they can figure out how to make it kind of accessible for as many people as possible. Uh, and I just I just thought it was incredibly compelling that it was this very traditional kind of radio adventure hour thing. It's, it's about 40 minutes of gameplay. Uh, and it was just it, this very super cool thing that, that just stuck it, you know, stood out very neat. Yeah, very different from, uh, I'm sure, everything that you uh, got to see. And very physical, right? Like everything else is virtual, but no. Yeah, this you is definitely actually are right sitting down in front of a, a real looking radio. It was yeah, very cool. That's awesome. Russell Holly, so awesome. Anytime we can get you on the show, we really appreciate you taking time, especially running back to your hotel room to do this. Thank you, Russell. Have fun for the rest of your time at GDC. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me. All right. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. And that is it because we did our stories the week earlier. So now it's just time to sign off. Mm -hmm. Tech News Weekly records live every Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us at tnw at twit.tv. And subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash tnw. Follow us on the socials. Follow all the Twit accounts. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram. And if you want to tweet at me, I'm at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell. Thanks to everyone who helps us each and every week. Alex Burke, Jammer B was in here. Colleen, everybody helps us here today. And today and every day we do this show. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate you. So thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody.